From Trisha Tillen's article, The New Thing, Global Revival as the Key Element in Deception in 20th Century Pentecostalism, she wrote, The world and much of the church is heading straight into the Antichrist delusion. God wants you to survive. He does not want you to fall. That is why he appoints watchmen to sound the trumpets of alarm, and also why he offers you the tools for understanding the danger. 2 Corinthians 11, 12 through 15. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. I feel like this is literally happening. I believe some very heavy programming has been laid on the church. It started a long time ago and we were born into it. I believe actual occultists Practitioners of the dark arts have been placed in the church, established ministries, mega churches, Christian media, even missions organizations. Maybe some of them are programmed themselves or deceived themselves, but many are knowingly carrying out the plans of the enemy on the body of Christ, doing his work right in their midst, right in their faces, casting spells on people and blinding them to the simple and powerful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so Jesus warned us, do not be deceived. Take heed, do not be deceived. Is it possible that all that's going on in the church, all the deception that's going on, is it possible that these people or some of these people are actually when you say wolves in sheep's clothing, they're not bad sheep. Okay, they want to destroy you. And they're pretending to be sheep. Okay, we know this, but is it possible that these people are like literally occultists, like Freemasons, Luciferians, you know, working completely opposite of the purposes of God, using Christian language, but actually teaching the opposite doctrine, even though they say Jesus and stuff. So this is what I've come to believe, and I'm going to go over some proof, some information, some some quotes um, to see, is it possible, is there a plan to infiltrate the church with occult doctrine and practices, mysticism, and Freemasonry. And they're all kind of the same thing. New Age. So what is Theosophy and why is it important? Okay, this is from the Theosophical Society website. They have a vision of wholeness that inspires a fellowship united in study, meditation, and service. They have a mission of encouraging open-minded inquiry into world religions, philosophy, science, and the arts in order to understand the wisdom of the ages, respect the unity of all life, and help people explore spiritual self-transformation. Theosophy was established in the 19th century and founded by the Russian immigrant Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. This is her, since she's sweet. Theosophy and other esoteric and occult religions teach that so-called ascended masters are formerly humans who have completed their reincarnations on earth. They now supposedly work together to help those still incarnating make a positive impact on the development of mankind. Ascended masters are helping mankind by revealing the sevenfold rays, the different spiritual dimensions, and other deep secrets to this mystery religion. Archangels are above them and assist the Ascended Masters and us where needed. Here's one of her quotes. It is but natural to view Satan, the serpent of Genesis, as the real creator and benefactor, 
the father of spiritual mankind. For it is he who was the harbinger of light, bright, radiant Lucifer, who opened the eyes of the automaton created by Jehovah, as alleged. And he who was the first to whisper, In the day ye eat thereof, ye shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil, can only be regarded in the light of a Savior. And now it stands proven that Satan, or the red fiery dragon, the Lord of Phosphorus and Lucifer, or light bearer, is in us. It is our mind. It is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god. And here we have her magazine called Lucifer. And here's a close up of all the nice things that she says about Lucifer being the morning star and all that. Now we have their logo. It says, there is no religion higher than truth. And you can see a snake eating its tail and a swastika. And that is not the Star of David. Uh, looks like that Egyptian cross also. Now we come to Lucius Trust, which is essentially the spiritual uh, doctrine or department of the United Nations. In 1922, Theosophist Alice Bailey and her husband Foster founded the Lucifer Publishing Company, but now it's known as Lucius Trust, which is centered in the United Nations. You will see why the connection between Hel Helena Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, Lucius Trust, and the United Nations is so significant. And here we have, right from the Lucius Trust website, the esoteric meaning of Lucifer. There are comments on the World Wide Web claiming that Lucius Trust was once called Lucifer Trust. Such was never the case. However, for a brief period of two or three years in the early 20s, when Alice and Foster Bailey were beginning to publish the books, published under her name, they named their fledgling company Lucifer Publishing Company. By 1925, the name was changed to Lucius Publishing Company and has remained so ever since. Both Lucifer and Lucius come from the same root word, Lucius, meaning Lat the Latin generative case meaning of light. The Bailey's reasons for choosing the original name are not known to us, but we can only surmise that they, like the great teacher H.P. Blavatsky, for whom they had enormous respect, sought to elicit a deeper understanding of the sacrifice made by Lucifer. Alice and Foster Bailey were serious students and teachers of Theosophy, a spiritual tradition which views Lucifer as one of the solar angels, those advanced beings who, Theosophy says, descended, thus the fall, from Venus to our planet eons ago to bring the principle of mind to what was then animal man. In the Theosophical perspective, the descent of these solar angels was not a fall into sin or disgrace, but rather an act of great sacrifice, as is suggested in the name Lucifer, which means light bearer. And here are a few Alice Bailey quotes. Let light and love and power and death fulfill the purpose of the coming one. And the coming one is not Jesus. Forgetting the things that lie behind, I will strive toward my higher spiritual possibilities. I dedicate myself anew to the service of the coming one and will do all I can to prepare men's minds and hearts for that event. I have no other life intention. Wow. And here is the 10 point plan to destroy Christianity by Alice Bailey. I believe this is a compilation taken from concepts in her all her writings. So here's number one, take God and prayer out of the education system. Number two, reduce parental authority over the children. Number three, destroy the Judeo-Christian family structure or the traditional Christian family structure. Number four, if sex is free, then make abortion legal and make it easy. Number five, make divorce e easy and legal. Free people from the concept of marriage for life. Number six, make homosexuality an, an alternative lifestyle. Number seven, debase art, make it run mad. Number eight, use media to promote and change mindset. Number nine, create 
an interfaith movement. Number 10, get governments to make all these laws and get the church to endorse these changes. How do you think her plan's going so far? Okay, so theosophy is what Alice Bailey taught and Helena Blavatsky. Um, Helena Blavatsky, the founder of um, Lucifer Magazine, and um, her editor, Annie Besant, along with other occultists, believe that the Christian churches were the key to introducing the doctrines of Lucifer to large masses of people. The 1904 annual report of the Theosophical Society stated, I believe it is through the churches and not through the Theosophical Society that Theosophy, the worship of Lucifer, must and should come to large bodies of people in the West. This was in 1904. And then eight years later, in 1912, the Theosophical Society stated, Our lodges continue their propaganda work. Outside the lodges, many of the members engage in what is really theosophical work, such as lecturing, talking on the principles we are trying to put forward, preaching, and other activities in connection with the Christian churches and other organizations. This is in 1912. Alice Bailey, believing that we were on the threshold of a new spiritual awakening, said that this new enlightened age would come, not around the Christian church, but rather through it. She said the outer layers would initially be kept intact. Christian terminology would still be used, but the changes would take place obscurely from the inside. Is this not what we are witnessing happening today through the, the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation? Kingdom Dominion, Purpose Driven, Contemplative, Emerging, Interfaith, Church? Here are some Alice Bailey quotes. These are things that she wrote. Very definitely may the assurance be given here that prior to the coming of the Christ, adjustments will be made so that at the head of all great organizations will be found either a master or an initiate who has taken the third initiation. At the head of certain of the great occult groups of the Freemasons of the world and of the various great divisions of the church and the resident in, and resident in many of the great nations will be found initiates or masters. Teachers must be trained. Bible knowledge must be spread. The sacraments must be mystically interpreted. And the power of the church to heal must be demonstrated. So she wasn't trying to get rid of the church. She was trying to use the church for Lucifer. Okay, is that weird? The three main channels through which the preparation for the new age is going on might be regarded as the church, the Masonic fraternity, and the educational field. All of them are as yet in relatively static condition, and all are as yet failing to meet the need and to respond to the inner pressure. But in all of these three movements, disciples of the Great Ones are to be found, and they are steadily gathering momentum and will before long enter upon their designated task. So she's talking about the Freemasons, the church and the Freemasons. And there's one more, there's a lot more, but here's one more. She says it again. There's no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of a paramount importance at this time. These mysteries will be restored to outer expression through the medium of the church and the Masonic fraternity when the Great One, that's the Antichrist, the coming one, when the Great One comes with his disciples and initiates, we shall have the restoration of the mysteries and their exoteric presentation as the consequence of the first initiation. Okay, so here is what Alice said about the kingdom of God. 
It is time that the church woke up to its true mission, which is to materialize the kingdom of God on earth, today, here and now. The time has passed wherein we can emphasize a future incoming kingdom. People are no longer interested in a possible heavenly state or a probable hell. They need to learn that the kingdom is here and must express itself on earth. Okay, this is Lucifer worshipping Alice Bailey saying that. She also said, quote, Your spiritual goal is the establishing of the kingdom of God. One of the first steps towards this is to prepare men's minds to accept the fact that the reappearance of the Christ is imminent, like in pre-tribulation. Sorry, but that's what that sounds like. You must tell men everywhere that the masters, the masters, the sevenfold rays, and their groups of disciples are actively working to bring order out of chaos. That's the Freemasons motto. You must tell them that there is a plan. And that sounds like QAnon. And that nothing can possibly arrest the working out of that plan. Nothing can stop what's coming. You must tell them that the hierarchy stands in it that it, that it has stood for thousands of years and is the expression of the accumulated wisdom of the ages. You must tell them above all else that God is love, the hierarchy is love, and that Christ is coming because he loves humanity. This is the message which you must give at this time, and with this responsibility I leave you. Work, my brothers. My kingdom does not belong to this world. I would like to mention here that you have to kind of decode what she says because when she says Christ, she does not mean Jesus. She means the Antichrist. When she says God, she is talking about Satan. And the hierarchy is all those fallen angels, the powers and the principalities. Okay? On the Lucius Trust website, this is how um, they want to sell the plan. The working out of the universal ideas of the plan takes place as humanity responds to higher impressions of the wholeness and sacredness of life and strives to intelligently embody these insights in all areas of thought, activity, and relationship. Economic, political, educational, legal, psychological, religious, and so on. And here's another quote from Lucius Trust. The hierarchy of light. The hierarchy works ceaselessly and could be compared to a great army working for world upliftment. I think that sounds like white hats, but I'm just saying. They are the inspiration for the major changes being implemented in the world, yet they take no credit for the work that they do. Through the process of spiritual impression, they influence those leaders and progressive thinkers whose minds and hearts are receptive to the new and forward-looking incoming ideas. Their work extends to all aspects of our planetary life. Politics, education, religion, art, science, psychology, and economics. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wow. In 50 years' time, the need for true psychics and conscious mediums, such as Helena Blavatsky, who loves Satan, will be very great if the Master's plans are to be carried through to fruition, and the movement must be set on foot in preparation for the coming of Him for whom the all nations wait. <clears throat> okay, so Bailey wrote that in 1925. That in 50 years, this would, this would happen. So 50 years later, on August of 1975, a new version and a greater era of dominionism was birthed and confirmed by many in the church and even in different locations in the world concerning the need for the church to infiltrate seven secular cultural spheres of influence so Jesus can return. Yikes. And then in 1975, just like magic, 
Bill Bright, founder of Cru Campus Crusade for Christ, and Lauren Cunningham, founder of YWAM Youth Mission, developed a God-given, world-changing strategy. Their mandate? Bring godly change to a nation by reaching its seven spheres, or mountains, of societal influence. Look at this. They concluded that in order to truly transform any nation with the gospel of Jesus Christ, these seven facets of society must be reached. Religion, family, education, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business. Wow, it looks just like the Lucius Trust website. And here's Lauren Cunningham's little story about it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the Seven Mountain Mandate. And here's a book by Bill Johnson and Lance Walnow called Invading Babylon, the Seven Mountain Mandate. When did God tell his people to invade Babylon? I think he said to flee Babylon. Flee from the midst of Babylon. Let everyone save his life. Be not cut off in her punishment. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, the repayment he is rendering her. And now you get to hear Lance Wall now explain to you, in his own words, about the Seven Mountain Mandate. ...in the West are not shaping culture because they don't understand the game. The game is not souls only, but nations. If you get a nation, you can win souls. Um, it's not about just focusing on eternity. It's about focusing on what's happening now. It's not about simply the spiritual side of life, it's also about the natural or the secular side. It's about taking the, um, the inspiration of the Word of God and unpacking it covertly and overtly into forming the values and principles of culture. You see how he just inverted everything, made everything backwards and upside down? He's a fast talker. He just turned everything upside down. Instead of souls being saved, which is why Jesus died on the cross, it's about nations and systems. Instead of eternity, it's the here and now. Instead of spiritual, it's secular. Instead of preaching the gospel, it's te preaching it covertly. What if Jesus really meant it when he said, my kingdom is not of this world? If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would have fought to prevent me from being captured. Oh, you speak of a kingdom. It's not you for an assignment. It's not upon you to have more intimacy with Christ. We think that the main purpose of God is to increase his presence in our life. It's not. Quite frankly, you want to increase his presence, die. Did you hear that? <laughs> Believers on the earth are more frightened at the prospect of taking on the insurmountable giants represented by the mountains near them in their nations. They're more intimidated by trying to take possession of what is a opposition that has strength and fortification in the natural. From the IRS to Hollywood to whatever. Most believers are afraid. So they create a theology that eliminates the responsibility for having to take territory and rather focuses on just getting people saved so that we're just getting people saved so that we're just getting people saved so that we're just getting people saved so that when Jesus comes back he can repopulate the earth with people that are followers and let him take over the planet yeah like the bible tells us to when Islam rises the end doesn't come when China rises the end doesn't come when the antichrist rises the end comes when the church rises and the gospel of the kingdom is preached it's the church that determines when the end comes Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Okay, so what I'm trying to show you is that the Seven Mountain Mandate seems to be um, Alice Bailey's idea. 
And the Seven Mountain Mandate says that the Christians, I'm using air quotes, will be taking over the Seven Mountains, which means the entire world, before Jesus can come back. However, what the Bible says is that when Jesus returns, he will take power and he will make the kingdoms of this earth the kingdoms of our God. Who is in control when Jesus comes back? It's the beast system or the new world order or whatever you want to call it. And he's not the only one saying this. Here's a few other examples. I know when Jesus is coming back. When we bring him preached, it's the church that determines when the end comes, so not the God devil. God is not coming to conquer his enemies. Jesus not, is not coming to conquer his enemies. He's sat down until his enemies are already made his footstool. And when that job, when that task is complete, then Jesus will be released to return. Here's another seven mountain promoter, Johnny Enlow. In his book, The Seven Mountain Prophecy, describes what the Elijah anointing will do before Christ returns. Please notice who is doing the destroying. One has to ask if this is based on truth or is it delusion. Unfortunately, many agree with this mentality. Quote, Elijah will first come and raise up that which will destroy the spirit of Baal and the spirit of Jezebel here on earth. We are going to take on the false prophet and the beast, and we are going to annihilate both of them. When they are crushed, we will come to the Lord and say, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. Revelation 11.15 We will present the nations of the world to the Lord as his possessions. They will be the dowry that the Father is providing for us to present to the bridegroom. Lovesick for his bride, Jesus will no longer be able to restrain himself and will burst through the clouds to come sweep us off our feet. Our Prince Charming will come on a white horse and take us away. See Revelation 19.11 But he's not coming for a lazy, spoiled prostitute. He's coming for an overcoming conquering, love-motivated bride who has made herself ready by fulfilling her mission. See Revelation 9, 19.7. The Elijah Revolution is the catalyst for all of these things. Let's compare that to what the scripture actually says. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. I, I'm thinking that the Jesus who comes back to receive a kingdom from people that have built it for him is not the is not the real Jesus. It's the Antichrist. I'm I think the Antichrist is isn't gonna look like anti. He's gonna look like instead of or false, pretend, fake. I think. He is going to fool even Christians. And now that Christians, and this is all blending together, it, it looks like that could be the plan. Paul, when he wrote to the Thessalonians, he's demonstrating that they become Christians. And he gives a number of reasons why they become Christians. He says your work of, your work of faith and labor of love and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. And then what does he say? and to wait for his son from heaven. That's the hope of the church. And that was one of the marks that they were real Christians. Now, if you believe in a post-millennial return of Jesus, you can hardly be waiting and expecting him to return now. 
But that's the teaching of the New Testament over and over and over that they were expecting the return of Jesus Christ and this is their hope. It's in heaven. Now, if Jesus is going to catch us up, 1, Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the dead in Christ will rise first then. And what does it say? We shall not, we who are alive and remain shall not precede those who have died. It says it clearly. Earl Paul quotes the scripture. We who are alive and remain, you want to know how he finishes it? Have been left here to manifest immortality, victory over death and disease. And not until we do that can Jesus return. And we're going to manifest this without the resurrection, without the return of Jesus Christ. It is a perversion of the Word of God. Now, if the real Jesus is going to catch us up and we're going to meet him in the air, and you're looking forward to meeting a Jesus who when you meet him, your feet are planted on planet Earth, and he has simply arrived to take over the kingdom you've established in his name, you have been under a heavy delusion. You have been working for the kingdom of the Antichrist, not for the true Christ. You have been working for the kingdom of the Antichrist, not for the true Christ. That's what it all boils down to. And that is just one way that I believe the Alice Bailey plan of infiltrating the church is um, showing itself in the Seven Mountain Mandate and Dominionism. And here are some guys that are very influential. Here we have Lance Wall now with Kenneth Copeland. And over there is Jesse Duplantis. These are the prosperity preachers. Read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. The scepter of righteousness was pointed at me and I became equal with Jesus. And look, it's a victory thon. They're raising money for the Kenneth Copeland TV network. And here we have a Kenneth Copeland TV show called Flashpoint. And you can see Lance Wall now there in the middle. And on the right, we have Hank Kuhneman. And in the lower left, we have General Michael Flynn. And then we've got the pillow guy. And we've got Clay Clark from Reawaken America. I just wanted you to see that these guys are all working together. And now here's Johnny Enlow with Michael Flynn and Clay Clark. And that's Steve Schultz from the Elijah List, which we just heard about the Elijah anointing. And now I will show you something that is also related to Alice Bailey and connected to all of these guys. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And now I'm going to show you a very good concrete example of the Alice Bailey plan in action very recently, a couple years ago, with Michael Flynn um, repeating Elizabeth Clare Prophet, who was a cult leader and a theosophist. And I am going to explain to you exactly what this prayer is all about. You are your instrument of those sevenfold rays and all your archangels. All of them. And I am the instrument of those sevenfold rays and archangels, and I will not retreat. I will take my stand. We will not retreat. We will stand our ground. I will not fear to speak. We will not fear to speak. And I will be the instrument of God's will, whatever it is. We will be the instrument of your will, whatever it is. In the name of Archangel Michael and his legions, I am preborn and I shall remain preborn. In your name and the name of your legions, we are freeborn and we shall remain freeborn. And I shall not be enslaved by any foe within or without. And we shall not be enslaved by any foe. Within or without? So help me God. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you very much. Okay, so this, these are the seven fold rays that Michael Flynn is just talking about, which emanate from the great source. Helena Blavatsky identifies the first seven rays were the, she said they were the primeval celestial beings 
variously called the primordial seven. Helena Blavatsky also said, it is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god. And this is her magazine, Lucifer. So when Michael Flynn says, we are the instrument of your sevenfold rays, whose sevenfold rays? Satan or Lucifer is that source. And C.W. Ledbetter, 33rd degree Freemason, he said, they are the seven sublime lords of the secret doctrine the primordial seven, the creative powers, the incorporeal intelligences, the Dihan Chohans, the angels of the presence, because they stand ever in the very presence of the Logos himself, representing there the rays of which they are the heads, representing us therefore, since every one of us is part of the divine life in every one of them. Okay, so that's their spiritual hierarchy which is also spoken about by Paul in Ephesians 6, 12, when he says, For we, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So what we have is Michael Flynn praying a prayer to the powers and principalities and the rulers of darkness in Hank Kuhneman's church with his congregation praying along with him. Run. just one name that can keep you out of hell and it's the name of Jesus the name of Jesus